Good afternoon, and welcome to From Live to Archive, facilitating data flows to produce a complete patient picture. A webinar tweet chat combo from healthsystemcio.com, sponsored by LK. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by Kate Gamble, our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat, or you can simply view the tweet chat in the Media Viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A panel today, so type your questions in as they occur to you, and we'll take them later in the program. Leave the default set to all panelists, and you could download the deck by using the URL on your screen, and it's also being sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 35 minutes with our panel discussion featuring Dr. John Halamka, CIO at Beth Israel Deaconess Health System, Steve Garaya, Associate Corporate CIO and CISO with the Westchester Medical Center, and Kamal Patel, CIO at LK. So without any further delay, let's jump right in. Dr. H, how about an overview of your organization and role, which is Changing, things are happening. Beth Israel always active, right? Well, absolutely. So on March 1st, the Beth Israel merges with the Leahy Clinic, creating a $7 billion, 40,000 employee healthcare system, second largest employer in the Commonwealth of Mass. I will serve the innovation lead role. And you, of course, ask, well, I've been a CIO for 23 years. Why would I move to an innovation role? And the reason for that is I'm looking at the future of healthcare as needing to be disrupted with novel data flows, new players, new analytics, and new techniques, whereas being a CIO, really, really important, keeping things running and solid and secure. So if I spend the next couple of years figuring out how to radically change what we do, maybe that's the best use of my skill. Excellent, excellent, very good. Steve? Hey, Anthony, thanks for having me, uh, Dr. Lahamka and Kamal. Nice to be here with you guys. Uh, I work for Westchester Medical Center serving as the Associate Corporate CIO and CISO. We're about a 10 hospital system in the Hudson Valley. Main campus is Westchester Medical Center, a quaternary care facility. Going through a tremendous amount of change as we're about to embark on implementing an enterprise-wide EMR and a series of other changes that are hitting us all at once. So it's quite an exciting time to be here. Very good, Steve. Thank you. Kamal? I'm the CIO at LK. Uh, we uh, are operating in five business segments. We work with uh, hospitals and health systems, help them archive clinical data, help them uh, with interoperability challenges. Uh, we work with ambulatory practices and help them with connectivity. Uh, we work with payers and help them towards uh, value-based care. And uh, we work with a lot of ancillary vendors, uh, voice-enabled telehealth vendors to help them solve the interoperability challenges. Uh, and we also work with a lot of laboratories, diagnostic labs. Uh, one of the things that uh, if you look at, uh, we are known as the healthcare data plumbers. And we essentially build these sites to connect different entities, uh, but to help them talk to each other uh, through all these disparate, uh, across disparate systems, across disparate data formats. Uh, and uh, uh, lately, we've been trying to bring uh, the patient and the providers closer uh, with all the solutions that, we, have, that uh, we provide across our customer base. Very good. Thank you, Kamal. All right, let's get into it. So let's start with you, Dr. Halamka. We talk a lot about interoperability, data flows, so let's start with that before we bring in sort of archiving scenarios. You want to take us through, so, you know, this is a challenge, right? Data flowing is a challenge. Give me some scenarios as a CIO that, that you grapple with, um, the different applications and information from different sources that needs to come together for a patient and provider at a particular place in time, some of the more challenging ones, and just talk about that a little bit. Well, sure. Uh, so a couple of years ago in my role running federal advisory committees, I asked some principals at the Senate Help Committee, you know, the health, education, labor, pensions, the folks who really oversee from the Senate perspective EHRs, 
I said, what's interoperability? And they said, oh, every data element in a patient's lifetime exchanged with every stakeholder for every purpose in real time at no cost. Well, if that's your definition of interoperability, Anthony, I think we should all just go home right now because it is unlikely in 2019 that that's what we'll be able to achieve. And the way I thought about interoperability is we take domain by domain, problems and meds and labs and rads and allergies and notes, and one by one, we define the semantics and the vocabulary and the nature of how we represent the data, its provenance and metadata. And so today with CCDA and FIRE and Direct and organizations like Commonwealth and tools like Interface Engines, we're getting closer and closer to being able to have what I would call a core data set available at the point of care for patients. But where is it hard still? I would argue it's not a technology problem, it's a psychiatry problem, right? <laughs> that is, uh, if you tell a major healthcare system, please share all of your data with me, you might get back a statement like, oh, it's our data. Or I worry about being punished for a privacy violation. Or I worry you're going to steal my patient. So I think, you know, our greatest challenge is ensuring alignment of incentives that the data that is available with open standards can flow without a huge amount of effort or a huge amount of cost so that the clinician has it in the right place at the right time and it's usable data. I really don't want every ICU blood pressure measurement for the last three weeks not very useful, right? What I need to care for the patient with quality now. So psychiatry, turning data into wisdom and making it straightforward. Those are some real challenges. Steve? Uh, great point, Dr. Lamka, uh, on fully understand the challenges that exist today. But one of the uh, major concerns I have with the data is looking at uh, people evaluating the data and all these big AI initiative and big data initiative not having a full understanding of what, how to use the data effectively and making inaccurate decisions or judgments uh, based on the data, not looking at how the data is collected, errors or input issues that they have with workflows, and just making a decisions based on the data itself and not taking into consideration what were the issues as the data was recorded. So um, people are trying to find ways of eliminating those biases, but it does, it does exist when you have non-clinicians making decisions in these big AI projects or big AI tools or uh, companies that are not relying solely on the clinical expertise to fully understand the data and how it's presented to them. So I see that as a huge risk as we move forward, unless we get folks that understand what the data really means and the issues that are associated with it being collected, we're bound to make errors in judgment. That's an interesting point, Steve. So you're, you're concerned that the, there can be questions about the underlying data, and we want everyone to have data in the right place at the right time, but as I think what you're saying is, it's got to be quality data, which some people take for granted. Um, is that kind exactly. of what you're saying? Exactly yeah. what I'm saying. And the interpretation of that data, taking the data at face value and not understanding what it means and what issues may have been associated with recording the data and the data recording process as well. Well, Dr. H, I mean, that's if if people question the data, I mean, we're done, right? I mean, how do we move forward with that? The point that everyone makes is that you have to prove to the doctors, so to speak, you know, for example, that the data is good and show them and convince them, then you can move forward. But if there's questions about the data, and, and what are your thoughts? Are there questions around data that's out there in health systems that is being used to make clinical decisions? Sure. So let me give you two examples. You know that if we look at the marketplace today of EHRs across the country, We've got Epic and Cerner and Meditech and Athena and eClinical Works, and after those five, then there's a fairly long tail of others. But do you know the workflow in each of those five major EHRs is totally different? So when I ask who entered the medication list and reconciled it, 
Was it the doctor, the nurse, a clerk, a pharmacist, a social worker? Right? Every one of those EHRs has different workflow possibilities. So when I then say, oh, this medication list is absolutely accurate, well, wait a minute. It really depends on where in the workflow, what person in what role entered it and how it was validated. And so mm -hmm. it turned out Beth Israel Deaconess, some years ago, when we did medication reconciliation as part of Meaningful Use, we implemented a completely novel workflow where it was, in effect, like Facebook. Well, maybe Facebook's a bad example. That sounds insecure. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the idea that your care team, your doctor, your nurse, your pharmacist, and your social worker would work together with you, the patient, and family to create a fully validated medication list with really high accuracy. So we built a workflow that made the provenance of that data extremely trustworthy. But here's another problem. Do you know that in every EHR you might be able to enter the data in a different place? And yeah. so we, as you might guess, have quality metrics and doctors are paid based on quality metrics. So we have a, what we would call a closed loop process by looking at your quality measures and then coming back to you and saying, well, why is it you're not counseling your patients? about smoking cessation. And the doctor will say, well, I am. And I put it in the note. Well, that's great, except there's a field you're supposed to check so that we can actually measure it. Oh. So it requires, even if the provenance and workflow are good, education and closing the loop with a clinician to reinforce how and when they enter the data to ensure it's sufficient quality. Exactly. Not everyone have you with the helm, and there are many organizations that do not have set processes, so thus uh, the concern is, you know, raised uh, among many, many different organizations. Kamal, let me bring you in. Your, your company obviously is involved with, with moving data from here to there, migrating it, usually from application to application, the, the older version to the new and current and go-forward version. But we're still talking about a lot of moving of data, right, and, and translating and migrating. So um, how, how does LK make sure that data quality is, is remaining paramount in the work that it does? So when, we, uh, when you look at LK as a code, like our focus was, hey, you know, make the data interoperable. And then we found a gap that these uh, health systems are facing where they had a lot of legacy data uh, that was uh, sitting around where they're paying a lot of maintenance dollars on an annual basis. So the archiving evolved uh, using the knowledge that we have in moving this data back and forth. The archiving evolved as a business to essentially help this health system significantly reduce the cost. Uh, in, when, so when we are archiving the systems, what we do is we have a process it's a 127-page document that we go through in terms of how we're going to ensure the integrity of the data. And there are rules around we work closely with the HIM departments, identify, because like John said, not only are the workflows unique for each of these systems, we also come across that each hospital or health system has evolved into their individual workflows. So we take those into account uh, build the pieces together to ensure that the data integrity is maintained. Because one of the things that we are doing is not only are we taking the data from one system, we are taking data from multiple systems within a health system and then consolidating it so they can, even on the historical data, they have an opportunity to see the longitudinal data. Uh, there are, uh, and then we try and bring in the ambulatory. So, uh, uh, so we are doing it through processes. Uh, it is still a challenge to separate out the Tylenol from the medications that may have an impact on, uh, you know, that the physicians would want to see for making uh, clinically beneficial decisions because of the data overload. Uh, uh, so we are looking at it from the cost perspective and helping the health system out. Very good. All right, Steve. Um, it seems so. So now let's bring in the archiving and legacy application. So, in a simplified world, right? Everybody's just got the systems they're using, but we know, and, and they have to send data and move data around between those applications. 
that's a simplified world, but we know that's not reality. You had mentioned that you're going, um, you know, an EMR, you're doing a new EMR. So now we've got, and everyone's got, and this is taking off more and more, more and more legacy systems. People are moving now as, you know, meaningful use. A lot of people just went, went electronic for the first time. Now a lot of them are moving on to their second, third, ver you know, vendor for any particular system. So we're getting layers, right? We get layers and layers of EMRs. We get layers of ERP, layers of all kinds of different applications. Things get more and more complex. The idea of sunsetting is great, but as we'll get into, things are not totally and completely and quickly sunset all the time. They live on right, in some form or another, in different ways you could do that. But I want to just talk to me about the increasing complexity as we have more and more applications being sunset, but not quite going away. Absolutely. Uh, we currently have about 200 plus systems we're trying to consolidate into a new system like EMR, and that goes from the big boys like a Meditech to an Athena to an ECW. We have variations of all scripts. Uh, we've been acquiring physician practices. As we move them to ECW, we still have that legacy sit the data sitting there waiting in a read-only format for us to do something about it. So it's a huge problem. And at this point, uh, we are, we're struggling until we met LK and realized that their processes were aligned with what I was trying to achieve or what the organization was trying to achieve. And so we have a plan now, and we just kicked off our project with them to basically bring everything into one archive system, not just bring it into a read-only system, but making it actionable data that you know our clinicians can have access to the data in a tangible manner, making it easy to access from the new EMR, but also making sure it's all tied together. So I know LK have an EMPI built into their system, making sure that that's tied to our EMPI that's tied into all of our different systems. And that's fine on the, on the higher level, but if you go, go deeper, we have a number of niche systems that have been out there that we were not even aware of that, it, that existed. So how do we understand what those systems are, what, how important that data is, and how do we bring them into the archive? That's a challenge we're trying to get through at this point. But as we move forward, we're discovering you know, more and more complexity to the archive project, but having LK as a true partner, understanding that they've been through this m multiple times, and having them guide us through the process has been one of the benefits of working with them. Dr. Halamka, can you talk a little bit about this dynamic I described and, and whether or not it makes sense to you about this ever-increasing complexity uh, as we go from vendor A to vendor B to vendor C over time and, and, and not quite sunset everything? If we're not sort of finishing up with, with the one that's three back and things continually stay, we're just getting blocks upon blocks upon blocks, it sounds unsustainable. Um, is, is that what happens? Take me through it a little bit. It's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me give you an example. And believe me, I love all vendors equally, so I will not in any way, shape, or form target criticism at any particular vendor. But there is a medical record system from the 1990s made by a company that begins with G and ends with E. I won't tell you who it is. <laughs> <laughs> particular medical record system has been sold a couple of times, right? And it was a popular medical record system in my um, ambulatory practices. And because of statutory requirements, we can't exactly just turn it off. So what do I have today? I have a Citrix-enabled read-only website of 1990s to early 2000s data from this medical record system, so it's there should a clinician need to look. Now remember, a clinician has 11 minutes to see a patient, enter 140 meaningful use data elements, make eye contact, never commit malpractice, and be empathetic. Do you really think they're going to go log into some legacy Citrix site to look up a note from 15 years ago? It's a tough problem. And so what have we done to try to address it? We recognize you're never going to migrate this stuff fully, but there are probably a few key data elements 
If you can take across the allergies, right, that's probably important. If you can take across some baseline labs, that's probably important. Problem list, probably important. Maybe the last care plan. So whether it's an automated transfer or what we agree is that in a particular legacy that's hard to migrate, we will at the point of a new appointment being made, a human will enter those data elements from the legacy Citrix view only system into the new EHR. And these are the kinds of things you have to really think about. You can't migrate everything. So what's most important? Steve, um, let me bring you in here and let's talk a little bit about security. So, because I know you're also a CISO. So, in in all these scenarios we're, we're talking about, we're going to talk about about applications that don't quite go away. And I want to bring in Kamal soon to talk about the different methodologies and different models of making things go away to different degrees, and certainly reducing costs of legacy systems. But if it exists, it must be it must be secure. Is that right, Steve? And and so and security yeah. never goes away. If the app doesn't go away completely, you're still responsible for security 15, 20, 30 years if you don't make it go away, correct? And that's a nightmare that I face right now. And it's a, it is a challenge to really apply our new security standards as we are moving down the path to high trust certification and trying to apply all these controls to those older systems, it's a significant challenge for us. So how do we do that? Do we do network segmentation? Do we micro segmentation? Do we limit access? It's not a one stop, one uh, size solution for everything. You have to have your controls in place and with everything security, it's about reducing risk. So we have to evaluate each scenario on its own and try to apply controls to reduce the risk of that set system. So as we move forward, we have a team evaluating our data, trying to categorize our data, looking at where the data is stored, who's accessing the data, who should access the data, who's been accessing the data. So as we move along the process, we're developing a strategy. It's not one strategy. It's a strategy per system. How do we reduce the risk as best as possible? But yet, it will never go away. It will always be a thorn in, on our side. Uh, forever, and I, I, it is a definitely a nightmare. Dr. Lomka, do you ever get sort of metrics on these old archives that you say, hey, listen, no one's looked at this for two years. No one's accessed it. Let's get rid of it. Is that a realistic scenario that happens? Unfortunately, there are statutory requirements for data retention that even if it isn't being used, I have to keep it. And okay. not only are the statutory retention requirements, there's always the plaintiff counsel request for medical records. And I, of course, would make this completely up. This is a fallacious example. But imagine that a baby is born at a hospital and 18 years after that birth, they're not admitted to Harvard. And some plaintiff attorney asserts, the OBGYN must have made a mistake. And therefore, please give me the medical record from 18 years ago. If you say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it, that's not a great defense. I mean, I know that's a wacky example, but the malpractice assertions you sometimes get are crazy. And you have mm -hmm. to be able to produce the data so that at the very least you, you say, look, you know, what you assert never happened. Here's the data. Right, right. All right, Kamal, let's bring you in here. Um, we're talking about, I, I want you to talk a little bit about the concept of making these things eventually go away, or to what degree you can make them go away. You know, as we get this layered uh, phenomenon or dynamic that I was talking about, uh, as you get, you know, more and more and you've moved on more and more, you don't want the third oldest system, the fourth oldest system still sitting around costing you money. I understand there's some requirements uh, for legal reasons that you can't make things go away, but I would imagine most CIOs want to make old systems go away and you help them do that to whatever degree you can. So take me through some of the requirements, some of the scenarios, the different things you can do for people that helps them get closer to making things go away. <laughs> so uh, when you look at a health system, uh, because of this, you know, if you look at the wave over the last couple of years, a lot of hospitals, uh, they went to uh, Cerner or Epic, okay, uh, Meritech, okay, some of the community ones, okay, they went to Athena Health. 
So what we now what they what they didn't do when they when they moved is they took some of the data that they wanted, like they took forward appointments, they took demographics uh, and insurance information, they took certain number of medications and allergies, but they didn't and they, they and they left all the other pieces of information hanging. Um, the risk uh, for them, you know, you mentioned security. So you have older systems, okay, which have a potential to be exploited. Uh, you have uh, you the hospitals are constantly on the burden of not only paying maintenance for the new systems that they purchase, but also on the legacy systems. So we uh, use the knowledge that we had on the interoperability. We look at archive as a stop gap, which is there is a short term demand in the market right now to help this hospital and health system reduce costs. And all the knowledge that we had on moving all this clinical data for vitals, medications, allergies, immunizations, notes, charts, images, we uh, essentially package all of that and keep this data yet discreetly. So uh, institutions like Howard or Beth Israel Deaconess, which are research oriented uh, or Intermountain Health, they can continue uh, on their uh, uh, paradigms uh, about research that they, uh, which their fellows or okay, residents, okay, they want to evolve. And uh, uh, institutions uh, that are focused on the cost side and speed, uh, they can essentially get those benefits. Um, the beauty of how we make the data accessible is, is an important part to usability. So not only we take this data, consolidate, and put it in an archive, but then we single sign on with the primary system, whether it is Meritech or Epic or Cerner, Athena or eClinical Works. And, and they can, from within those underlying systems, when they open up a patient chart, so if they open up Kamal Patel's patient chart, they can just click on the longitudinal view in the archive, and they can they don't have to search. All of the historical information is available right there. Uh, and it also gives them a strategy where they can, they can archive four systems and then add four more or add 10 more uh, and constantly keep adding data without having to teach anybody how to use that system. And then there are processes around uh, uh, you know, how release of information happens, uh, how uh, 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 the uh, uh, communication with the HIM department is done to produce these legal medical records that tie in with the existing systems uh, uh, so uh, they can produce these records. And our goal is that uh, using the knowledge that we have for 170 different DHRs, how can we bring speed into the equation and how can we reduce cost uh, and solve this uh, problem that we, I believe that this is a couple of years problem. Uh, and once these systems are retired, uh, uh, the CIOs are again going to focus more on uh, these bringing the patients and these providers closer. Very good. Very good. Dr. Lamko, let me ask you, Obviously, you're very, very involved with policy and work on that stuff for us, and often interoperability and standards uh, come into policy. It, it will further development, refinement, work done on interoperability and standards and those kind of things, will that someday, you know, do away with these uh, interoperability issues? Will we get there to where it doesn't really matter if it's a legacy system because moving data between applications is just so easy? Okay, boy, you've asked me a very controversial question. So I will give you a controversial answer. You know the great thing about standards? There are so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so the challenge is this, we're gonna have all these great standards and you know fire, it's a wonderful thing. There are only four different flavors of it as of today. And none of them are compatible with each other. And really? so what does that imply? It implies there's going to be a forever, not a long tail, a forever need to deal with mapping between different versions of different standards running on different systems with different vocabularies and different data schemas. And so I applaud any notion of this middleware concept where that's fine, we'll reduce burden of interoperability more and more and more over time, but there will still need to be an orchestration layer 
that ensures that what we're sending has, I'm going to use a technical term here, an impedance match. You know, do you, do you remember nice. Hi-Fi, Anthony? You know, that is, is the sender and the receiver are kind of compatible with each other. And what we need to think about is Postel's law. Back in the days when email was invented, and yes, the guy who invented it was a guy named P-O-S-T-E-L, Postel. Amazing. Mm. What he said was send using a absolute adherence to the, san- the standard, but receive slop. And why? Because there are going to be so many senders that don't quite adhere to where they should. You have to tolerate slop. So we'll get better and better on the sending. We're still going to need middleware to tolerate the slop. So we're at four versions of Fire already. It's fairly recent, right, that Fire was developed, and I thought we were trying to learn from the lessons of the past and the different flavors of HL7, as I've heard that termed. Why does that keep happening? It seems like if we started a new standard today, eventually there would be different flavors of it. Is it just impossible to stick to one? I don't know. Let me tell you about the process. It's all good, right? It's, it's headed in the right direction. So um, um, I've forgotten, Anthony. What kind of car do you drive? Uh, Dodge uh, SUV. Uh, okay. Whatever you call well, it. Well, gee, in, in, 19, in, in 1960, there was no such thing as an SUV, right? So you would have had, I don't mm-hmm. know, a Ford Fairmont or something. So what we said <laughs> was um, cars – need some ability to change because we haven't figured out what the ideal car is yet. So what Fire said was, this is pretty early. So let's have the ability and agility to change as we figure out what's right. Once we figure out what's right, then we will have what's called a normative standard. And once you declare a normative standard, then it must be backwards compatible. And so in 2019, FIRE DSTU-4 uh, is going to, in fact, be normative. So, yes, 1, 2, and 3 all were agile and evolved, and we went from station wagons to SUVs. Well, now we've kind of figured out what a Tesla – well, I made that up, of course – you know, it looks <laughs> like, you know, and, and that forevermore we're going to say it's going to be backwards compatible. That's, that's the journey often when you innovate you have to be on. Okay. Steve, tell me a little bit more about your journey right now as you as you try and archive some of these systems. I know you're working with LK, but tell me what kind of resources are required internally, um, budgetary, human resources, and so we get some idea of the scope of this issue and this challenge that you're dealing with. Absolutely. It's like driving a Dodge. I'm kidding. Um, so, hey. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> As we move forward, I think the number of resources required is tremendous, but I think understanding who the data owners are, because these systems have been around so long, and getting the right people engaged in the project is more of a challenge versus the number of resources we would need. Yeah, you could throw money at anything and get as much resources as you need, and there are a number of firms that are willing to help us, but having folks that truly understand what that data was, who owned the data, how it was being used, what's the right amount of data to move, what should be moved, and a full understanding of your data set, it, it, it's even more critical to have those resources. For example, the HIM director may have changed in the last five years. The person who was the system administrator for a set system who's been here for 26 years have changed. And, and learning the learning curve of, dis, of discovering what the data is and who the data owners are, I find that challenge resource-wise is much, much more than, say, an analyst, a technician, a data extractor, or whoever Kamal's bring on site. That can be easily overcome with, you know, money. Well, again, there's limited funds, but you can overcome that. The knowledge and processes that were involved in formulating that data and maintaining that data and the importance of that data it's somewhat more of a challenge for us at this point. Right, right. Okay. Uh, I want to get an audience question here, and I think I want to run it by you, Kamal, first. When you pull in all the data into a universal archive, how do you handle user audit reports 
that are likely accessible in each of the existing applications. This is separate from clinical data, right? So that is correct. So we, when we pull in the data, uh, if the audit report data is available discreetly, then we pull them discreetly. If it is available as documents, then we pull them as documents. Now, any data that we pull in, uh, we are keeping them attached, uh, like we, they are flagged with an underlying system, like where this came from. So you can have audit reports come from like hundreds of different systems, but we have that ability to display all of them together. And if they are discrete, then we can show all of that information um, uh, longitudinally. Okay, very good. All right, uh, feel free to send your questions in now as, uh, and we will get to them right away. I'm gonna to go to my favorite feature, which is ask a co-panelist. So Kamal, why don't you go ahead and ask Steve or John or both a question. I have a question for Dr. Alamka. Uh, and uh, this is, we had a discussion, I think, several months ago on blockchain, but we only had about 45 minutes. So I, I, wa I, want, to, I want to understand, Dr. Halamka, what, what, do you, what are the different areas in healthcare where blockchain can be applied to get value? Well, what an excellent question. Uh, and let me give you three areas where I think blockchain could be helpful. And Anthony, since maybe not everybody on the call is familiar with the details of blockchain, think of blockchain as a decentralized, not corporate or government-owned public ledger you write once and can never erase. So how could that be useful? Well, I am a physician, and every year I have to credential with insurance companies across America. Do you know there are a thousand insurance companies across America? and they need every year for me to reprove I went to UCSF Medical School, that I did a fellowship, that I have board certification in emergency medicine, and that I haven't committed a felony. And my DEA is still intact. Well, do you know that I have to do faxes and handwritten notes and emails and phone calls? Wouldn't it be great if the DEA just put on the blockchain, here's a list of all people in good standing, or my medical school said, here are all our graduates. And since it's a decentralized public ledger with great trustability that you can never erase, then all our insurance companies just look to the ledger. No credentialing is ever needed again. Very simple. Or another one, consent is hard. So Anthony, I know your medical record's very controversial. You know, we've talked about this in the past. You had a flu <laughs> shot this year. <laughs> Blue shot, yeah. yeah. Well, so imagine that your consent preferences are share my vaccines, who cares? But then, mm -hmm. not that you would have this, but if there's a sensitive area of your medical record like substance abuse or mental health or something, you know, you might declare different preferences for sharing that. Today, all a consent is is a piece of paper on a fax machine or stored in some EHR in some doctor's office. So what if you put your consent preferences on the blockchain and anyone who wanted to exchange data about you would respect whatever preferences you posted there? And then finally, remember blockchain being immutable could be used in that example I gave about a malpractice assertion to prove that a medical record had never been changed over time, that there is integrity to the data. So those are sort of three reasonable use cases. I always shy away from any use case that involves cryptocurrency, because as we've seen in 2018 to 19, that's a pretty dicey area. Very good. <clears throat> All right, Kamal, you're good? Do you have a question for Steve, that or are you good? Amazing. Uh, that, that was the main that was, one? That was awesome. Thank you. All right, very good. Steve, do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Absolutely, Kamal, how do you see blockchain uh, evolving in healthcare, and how is LK possibly preparing for that, knowing that, it, it, you know, the value that's there, but with the onslaught of so many fintech, health tech companies trying to break into healthcare, how is LK evolving in anticipation of blockchain becoming more prevalent in healthcare? So, uh, we, when, when I looked at it, uh, 
uh, I was struggling to apply towards healthcare because we didn't want to take a look at, hey, you know, there are cool technologies that everybody likes to talk about, okay, and then uh, if you're not delivering any value, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, the type of business that we are in, uh, the uh, use case that I think would make sense would be audit. Uh, we are not doing anything right now. It's more, we have a research team uh, of 18 people, and they have been dabbling around, around applying, but we don't have any real strategy around where we could use it. But right now, we are more thinking around the lines of um, uh, accessibility of records within the health system, especially over the new demand for API. Like everybody talks about fire, uh, and then <clears throat> uh, the HL7 legacy connectivity is there. Uh, and then there are use cases where they're accessing data from within the health system or within uh, uh, an archive system uh, connected to a health system. Um, but if there was a centralized way where shared data uh, across different vendors, across different health systems, uh, uh, which where we can measure uh, the audit capability, that is that is an area that we're looking at right now. Uh, the use cases that uh, Dr. Alamka mentioned were uh, fantastic, and and I think that those are some real problems uh, where payers do pay a lot of money to validate a provider. Uh, but it's it's a field where we're keeping our eyes uh, out there for. Uh, yeah, but we don't have any specific uh, solution. Thank you, Kamal. <clears throat> Very good. And if, if John right, is, if, and John is John is the chief innovation officer. So if there are opportunities to voluntarily partner, okay, to build these things, okay, John, we'd be happy to uh, talk to you. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Holmke, you have a question for one or both of your panel fellow panelists. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys a hard question. Patient-generated healthcare data, Internet of Things, everybody's wearing something that's generating telemetry. What are we going to do with that data? Either of you can answer, All right. or both. I, I, I I'm, I'm going to hit... Go ahead. Okay, oh, I Steve, you're going first, buddy. Come on. I don't think it's what can we do with it, it's just how can we get it? How can we assemble all the data from multiple, multiple different sources of all these new IoT that, IOTs that are out there and bring it into one space so we can actually make sense of it? I think there is tremendous value in that, looking at the social determinants of health and you know, m making healthcare a consumer-driven business at this, at this point. The, the value is tremendous, but acquiring the data, put it in some way that you can actually make it usable, I think that is the challenge. Kamal? Yeah, my take on yeah. this is I'll share with you what we are doing today. Uh, in, in, and it's not necessarily a big strategic direction-wise, but what we've been doing is we've been pulling, we've been writing what we call adapters, uh, which uh, are, you know, like so we'll have a Fitbit adapter or we'll, uh, have a Medtronic adapter, uh, uh, or we'll have a sleep apnea adapter for, which is related to a specific company. And all of these patients, they have logins. So it's hard to get the data because those companies uh, are protecting the data and, they, uh, and not making it readily available via interfaces, uh, or at least uh, most of them are not. So what we've been doing is We've been uh, using this technology that everybody in the industry calls robotic automation. Uh, but behind the scenes, okay, it's really uh, screen scraping that you log into the systems, you identify the meaningful data, you bring it out, okay, and you discreetly store it in a database and make it available uh, to whoever uh, wants it. And in our case, it's primarily uh, organizations who are providing solutions around value-based care they want this data effectively, so they are deploying these adapters uh, where uh, you can sign in, okay, and uh, put in your device information, your login information, and then it's going to go and uh, uh, pull this data out. <clears throat> Very good. All right, one more audience question. I got a 
put this to you, Dr. Holomka. Is immutability really a characteristic of either an archive or blockchain? Well, how about this? Um, an archive <laughs> and blockchain might be totally different things, right? So an archive, it's true, you're going to put data, you're going to put things in your archive, but you may over time change that archive, delete the archive after some number of years. Blockchain isn't deletable. So, right, I guess the answer there is the one advantage of blockchain, it's a bit like a Wikipedia article. You can never really delete a Wikipedia article. All you can do is change it over time and provide a perfect audit trail of how you got to that change. So, sure, I guess based on current blockchain technology, we should think of blockchain as immutable. All right. Very good. Well, <clears throat> we are about out of time today. That was a lot of fun, and I didn't expect so much blockchain talk, but very good, very good. Uh, when you close out your WebEx window, you're going to be taken to a post-event survey. Please take a moment and answer that. You see the information on your screen retarding, re regarding continuing education uh, with Chime and such. You'll get an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel. If you would like us to produce a webinar for you, you can contact Nancy Wilcox, and you can go to our website to see our upcoming schedule of events. So with that, I want to thank our panel, Dr. John Holamka, Steve Garaya, and Kamal Patel. I want to thank LK for sponsoring this informative and fun conversation, and I want to thank you for continuing to come to our events. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much.